devils, demons, and evil spirits. Since time began, they have stalked our souls. And priests have tried to cast them out. Does evil really walk the earth? Or is it just inside our minds? Does modern medicine hold the key? What happens when science faces religion in the battle for the possession of men's souls? Enter the fifth dimension and the secret world of exorcism. exorcist carries out an ancient rite to drive out the devil infesting a human body. Not sometime in our dark past, but now in the modern world. Demonic possession means that somehow the entire personality of the individual has been taken over by evil forces, by supernatural evil. The entire, the entire person has come under possession by Satan or by evil spirits. Germany, 1977. 24-year-old Anneliese Michel. Trapped in the last throes of a Catholic tradition, she endured the horrors of exorcism until she died at the hands of her saviors. A sick girl or a vessel for demons? One priest has no doubts. I have performed thousands of exorcisms, and these tapes, I've heard enough of them. Hearing her voice, her whining, her behavior, the devil was definitely present here. The biblical symptoms of possession are things like shouting, talking in tongues, uh, hallucinatory states, jerking, stiffening. All of these things can also occur in epileptic seizures due to the excessive discharges of the part of the brain involved in the attack. When it comes to the idea of possession, the truth isn't out there. It's up here, and we need to look to science and not religion for the answers. In 1978, two opposing forces inside the Roman Catholic Church collided in a small town in Germany. On one side, the modernizers, scientific and rational, trying to implement the reforms of Vatican II. On the other, the traditionalists, wanting to hold to the old beliefs, for whom devils and demons were a reality. They felt that the power of evil was rising, not just in Germany, but worldwide. Mrs. McNeil. Self-doubt, not Earth. In the face of the enemy. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The power of Christ compels you! It's the power of Christ that compels you! The power of Christ compels you! The power of Christ compels you! It's God himself who commands you. American academic and writer Michael Cuneo. In the United States, exorcism was not practiced very widely at all up until the early 1970s. Americans didn't think of exorcism, they didn't think of demons when, when they had some problem. The movie changed this. And not only that movie, but all of the knockoffs, the imitation movies, because there were so many movies that followed uh, from that one. 1962, and Pope John XIII initiated Vatican II, the Great Ecumenical Council. 
His agenda? To bring the Roman Catholic Church into the modern world. It was a turning point in history. The Pope feared his holy charge would be left behind as the world moved on. He wanted a new era of progress and enlightenment, and his flock to reach out to other religions. Many agreed with him wholeheartedly, but some didn't. For them, strength lay in the old ways, the ancient beliefs and rituals. They feared revisions would weaken the eternal struggle against evil. The reality of demons and using exorcism to drive them out was one area where the church was split. Veteran exorcist Don Gabriela Amort. Jesus wants us to perform exorcism. Yes, he even empowers us to. Mark 16, 17. Those who believe in me will chase away the demons in my name. One only has to believe in Jesus Christ to have the power to chase away the demons in his name. Klingenberg, Bavaria. In 1975, something happened here which gave the exorcists their chance. The subject, 24-year-old Anneliese Michel. Covering the story was journalist Helga Kramer. The first thing that came to mind was that this was like something out of the Middle Ages when people saw the devil as real. These kind of things didn't belong to our enlightened times. This was the last official church act of exorcism in Germany. Two priests with family and friends carried out the ritual. Twice a week for nine months, six hours a day. Peter Hein was there. It went on for about an hour and a half. I can remember, as we were finished with this one, Padre Arnold said, OK, it's time for a break so that Anneliese can get some rest. Suddenly she began, rest? There's no rest here. It goes on and on. It sent a cold tingle down my spine. It gave me goosebumps. It took a terrible toll. After nine months, Anneliese Michel weighed just 31 kilos. Time and again, she injured herself. I witnessed how she was beaten by the demons. It happened like this and like that. On the 1st of July, 1976, starved and exhausted, Anneliese Michel died. Her priests and her family believed whatever they had done had saved her soul. They believed she was enduring possession by devils for the good of others. Franz Knoter was one of those priests. She made a promise to God that she accepted the possession, the possession of all these demons, for the savior of Germany and its youth. She accepted this as an atonement. This is why she wasn't cured and accepted her death. But need she have died? How does modern medicine assess her symptoms? Professor Simon Chauvin works at London's Institute of Neurology specializing in epilepsy. Patients sometimes think that epilepsy is a form of madness, uh, but this isn't true. Epilepsy is uh, a physical disorder of the brain. Epileptic fits happen when the brain's biochemical rhythms get out of balance. It's like an electrical short circuit with terrifying effects. When the discharges affect different parts of the brain, you get different types of symptoms. For instance, if the discharges affect the motor areas of the brain, you might get jerking or stiffening of the body. If they affect parts of the brain which are involved with memory, you may get abnormal memories. Um, if it affects parts of the brain affect with, to do with vision, you may get visual disturbances and hallucinations. Stiffening, hallucinations, and hearing voices all symptoms that the possessed Anneliese had displayed. Two years after the girl's death, a German nun announced she'd had a miraculous dream. She said deep in her grave, Anneliese Michel's corpse was still in perfect condition. 
proof she died for the sins of the world. Desperate to see the evidence that their daughter had not died in vain, her parents asked for an exhumation. The macabre occasion aroused huge interest from believers and unbelievers alike. Crowds were waiting for the miracle, but officialdom was not impressed. Thea Hein is a friend of the family. So they stood there, men and women, to the left and the right. They were denied entry. Then an official produced the order that said, you're not getting in, no question about that. We grouped together and suggested that maybe the Padre should enter instead. But he passed the order to the Padre too, who was also denied entry. Nobody was allowed in, nobody. The parents never saw their daughter's body. The police insisted the corpse was too decomposed for anyone to be allowed to view it. And the grave diggers who dug up and reburied her saw nothing miraculous. So you were present when the coffin was opened? Yes. You were there? Yes, I was there. So did something appear, a halo or markings or...? Well, I didn't see anything. Nothing of that nature? I didn't see anything. Did you see anything? What do you think should appear? We live in a world where we don't believe in hocus pocus anymore. When a person is ready, then he's gone. That's that. Some time later, Mr. Michel showed me a photograph. He told me that the hand of the devil can be seen on it, and therefore this proved the existence of the role of the devil in Annalisa Michel's case. This is the photographic evidence. Carefully examined and from certain angles, the outline of her perfectly preserved body might possibly be seen and also the hand of the devil. Official skepticism did not deter the family. Their belief that Annalisa had been possessed by the devil was unshakable. The reality of the demons of hell is the rock on which Rome's senior exorcist's faith is founded. Don Gabriela Amort has performed the rite hundreds of times, even when his own church was reluctant to allow it. Even in those days, there was not enough exorcism in Germany. It was the bishops and priests who could be held responsible for this, because they didn't believe. And he who doesn't believe in the devil and possession doesn't believe in the gospel. The Middle Ages, centuries of desperation and hunger, war and plague. Possession became the universal reason for illness, madness, or simple wrongdoing. Exorcism, the cure. In the name of Christ, thousands died. Professor Michael Cuneo has written extensively about it. Exorcism is virtually as old as religion itself. And so in medieval Europe, there would be local uh, priests and, and uh, local um, health and healing practitioners who would formally or informally try to expel people of their spirits, of their evil spirits. Within Roman Catholicism, um, there was this tradition, this legacy, this heritage of believing in evil spirits and demons and the possibility of demonization. Until 30 years ago, all Roman Catholic priests were trained in the rites. The ritual Romanum of 1614 lays down when exorcism should be used and lists the signs of possession. Horror of religious objects, supernatural powers and secret knowledge are on the list. So are exceptional strength and speaking strangely. But some of these symptoms are also ones modern medicine recognizes in many kinds of disturbed behavior. At London University, psychologist Chris French has made a study of illness in history. If we look at the kinds of behaviour that in the past and in modern times is often labelled as signs of possession, we can see that very often they correspond to 
uh, modern psychiatric and neurological conditions, things like, for example, schizophrenia, perhaps depression, certainly epilepsy and Tourette's syndrome. Anneliese Michel was a tragic victim of modern ignorance. Klingenberg on the River Main. Anneliese was born here in 1952, oldest of four sisters. Her father, Joseph, a carpenter, her mother, Anne Marie, a housewife. Deeply religious, they followed the old Catholic ways. As a child, she was often ill. The family didn't trust doctors, but they did trust their church. 30 years ago, her mother remembered her daughter. Even as a girl, her whole attitude was very devotional. We raised her like that. Because of her illness, she felt very close to God and always said, God will always come first in my life. At first, she was a normal schoolgirl whose ambition was to teach religious studies. Then, in 1963, she had her first fit. The symptoms were clear, rigid body and then shaking all over. The doctor diagnosed epilepsy, but her parents were reluctant to accept it. And although medical drugs were available, she didn't take them. She became depressed and withdrawn. It was the first indication of her troubled future. Living with epilepsy itself can cause depression uh, in a way which is independent of the brain disturbance. People treat people differently, people um, are stigmatized, they're shunned. And what these drugs do is insulate the nerve cells, uh, in a sense, so that the short-circuiting which is occurring uh, is, is suppressed. Now, these don't do anything about the underlying propensity to have a seizure. They don't cure the condition, but they do suppress the condition uh, whilst the drugs are being taken. But at 16, Annalisa was getting worse. Her fits were more frequent. She started to believe she was wicked and should punish herself for the sins of others. This is common with epileptics. Someone who was suffering from depression and therefore would be suffering from certain types of delusion would certainly feel that they were worthless and perhaps were being punished in some way for, for sins they'd committed. She wasn't allowed to sleep, wasn't allowed to rest. Annalise couldn't sleep in her bed for years. She had to sleep on the floor and she had to freeze during winter time. It was cruel how she suffered. 1968, and Annalisa is in hospital. Her parents had accepted her strange behavior, but the harsh, self-imposed regime had made her very ill, with tuberculosis. In hospital for months, homesick and unhappy, her delusions became worse. After one fit, the devil appeared to her in her room. But she kept this secret. She was terrified of her visions, but too frightened to tell anyone else. She thought if they knew, she would be called mad and would never achieve her life's ambition, to be a teacher. Her doctors tried to help. One way to diagnose epilepsy is with an EEG machine. It measures brain activity and shows up the excessive electrical discharges. Knowing her history of fits, the doctors sent her to the clinic at Würzburg University. Professor Jobst Berning is a psychiatrist here. And here see we now a snippet of the original EEGs. And here we see a clipping from the original EEG. Left, we can see a wave formation. It's an acute wave and a slowly proceeding delta wave. Here, also an acute wave, a spike, and a slow delta wave. This is not a typical spike wave pattern, but very similar. 
nach den damaligen Erkenntnissen exakte gute Anamnese. After these earlier insights, precise positive anamnesis and EEG, which is a functional recording of brainwave activity, was clear. The most probable diagnosis was epilepsy. Sichere Diagnose einer epileptischen Erkrankung. The Center for Epileptic Research in Bonn. Round the clock observation of the patients. It's a condition as old as history. Only the rational ancient Greeks diagnosed sickness of the brain. To everyone else, it was clearly demonic possession. I believe you can see how some of the fits we recorded on video definitely could raise the idea that in this condition, this person appears possessed. An epileptic fit initiated under medical supervision in order to measure the brain activity. <laughs> Professor Christian Elger from the Research Center. I have patients who describe how the entire room bursts into flames, even the sofa they're sitting on. This phenomenon spreads, more or less causing a typical temporal lobe fit, which is not the case for the schizophrenic forms of psychosis. In these cases, these perceptions and hearing of voices are permanent and often have a threatening nature. 1973. Anneliese has achieved her ambition to train as a teacher in Würzburg. She's accepted the epilepsy and agreed to be treated. As long as she takes her medication, life can appear normal. Nobody suspects the terrors which fill her mind. The delusions are getting worse. She can hear noises, thinks she's being pursued by the devil. She keeps working, but her essay betrays her. The title, Coping with Fear. It's not too surprising that someone who's brought up in a very religious background, who suffers from epilepsy, which will involve um, involuntary movements and the feeling that one has been taken over, and also depression, would actually end up being with the delusion that they are actually possessed by Satan or by evil spirits. That would make sense of the situation to them. The chapel of the Madonna of Engelberg, near Klingenberg. It's a place of pilgrimage for devout Catholics. Anneliese Michel came to find relief from her suffering. Her medication was keeping the fits under control, but her mind was not at peace. The Archangel Michael's victory over the devil confirmed she was trapped in the battle between good and evil. One day, she had a vision of the Virgin Mary explaining her illness came from God and had a higher purpose, to atone for the lost souls in the land. Believing the divine instructions, Anneliese gave up her medication and let the illness take its course. If a patient stops taking the drugs and they still have a propensity to have epileptic seizures, and when the drugs wear off, the seizures will recur. And the person uh, may experience a delusion or hallucination or symptom, uh, which is repeated in every seizure. So for instance, if somebody is, uh, hears voices during an attack, uh, it will be the same voices in each seizure, often saying exactly the same thing. And this is obvious when you think about it because it's the same part of the brain which has been activated in each seizure. Kleinwallstadt Church, a Catholic mass in the old tradition. The prayers are in Latin, the words unchanged for a thousand years. Here, the Vatican Council's reforms were rejected. 
The congregation wanted to hold on to the unchanged rituals, the ancient beliefs. Annalisa felt at home here. She too longed for certainty. Many of the congregation were devout pilgrims, seeking comfort at holy shrines. Thea Hein was the organizer. In 1975, Annalisa joined them on a trip to Italy. It was a fateful decision. Their goal was San Damiano outside Assisi. Built by St. Francis in the 13th century, the Virgin Mary is said to appear here. The Vatican no longer officially recognized these appearances, but for many, this was a place to seek help and comfort. Urged by her father, Annalisa had joined the group. But when they arrived at the shrine, she refused to get out of the bus. So I went back to the bus shortly before 12 to see if everyone had got off and been to see the Mother of God. And as I get there, who is still sitting in the bus? Annalisa Mikel. So I said, get out of there, I said. You won't find mercy in this bus. You will find mercy over there with the Mother of God. At first she didn't want to go. So I took her by the hand and let her out. Annalisa had recently stopped taking her medication and her behavior was starting to change. So Annalisa breaks free from my hand and starts to run. And she looked very strange. She took great big steps. She didn't walk the way she normally walked. I handed her a glass of the San Damiano water. She held it to her mouth. She wanted to drink from it, but then suddenly she put the glass down saying, this stinks, this stinks. Her refusal sealed her fate. The next day, I think, Mr. Mikel came and I told him what I thought, what I had deducted. Is Annalise possessed? Or is she confused? Something is not right with her. From that moment, nothing could stop the tragedy. And Annalisa's was the central role. People who believe they're, they're obsessed demonically or possessed demonically, that they have been influenced to an enormous extent by their culture by their cultural circumstances, sometimes by their family upbringing, sometimes by the churches they go to. Sometimes there are real terrific peer pressures and cultural pressures acting on people to convince them that they're demonized and that the problems they're experiencing are truly the result of demonic influence rather than something else. However, her family were convinced that she was possessed by the devil and called on their church for help. Rumors of her behavior had begun to ripple through the community. In the nearby town, a priest, Father Ernst Alt, collapsed while praying for her. Alt was a traditionalist, troubled by the reforms of Vatican II. A firm believer in the reality of devils and demonic possession, his collapse confirmed his feelings that evil was loose in his flock. Ridding Annalisa of her demons became his own personal crusade. Journalist Helga Kramer covered the case from the beginning. I felt that it was actually Alt who was the driving force of this story. A chaplain and a spiritual person, he was completely convinced that this was a case of possession and that the whole world should know about it. Alt was convinced exorcism was the right course, but he needed help with the ritual. He found it in the convent of Jesuits in Frankfurt St. George. 80-year-old Jesuit Father Adolf Rodovic 
had performed many hundreds of exorcisms and agreed to see Annalisa. At that first meeting was neurologist Ulrich Niemann. So Rodovic came to the house. Annalisa Mikkel was somewhere in a room. She had rolled around in muck and dirt and executed 400 knee bends in one hour, leaving her knees blue. Then she jumped up and slapped him round the face. And at this moment, the priest realized that someone with so much hatred, someone who strikes a religious person, a sanctified priest, must be possessed by the devil. For Anneliese, this decision was a death sentence. Her priests dismissed the idea of an ordinary illness. Epilepsy is out of the question in this case. An epileptic collapses and the fit fades quite quickly. Yet during the condition of possession, as possession continues, the patient gets worse and worse. This had nothing to do with the family. It was mainly factors that were from outside the family that influenced the case. The church, the very people who should have helped, actually helped strengthen a case which caused a catastrophe. Würzburg, seat of the bishop. Using Rodovic's diagnosis, Father Alt applied for permission from the bishop to start the exorcism. Bishop Josef Stangl supported the Vatican reforms, but was under intense pressure from his conservative priests. I think he had... Um I think he granted permission because it was prompted to him by his advisors. He made it very clear that they understood what they were dealing with. They had learnt this from their parochial teachings. He didn't want anything to be blown out of proportion with rumours. The situation needed to be taken by the hand and an official exorcism performed. On the 16th of December, Bishop Stangl agreed to allow the two priests to begin the rite. Their conviction was unshakable, and they felt Anneliese shared it. She was always convinced that she was possessed. She usually said she felt this pressure in her head, even if everything seemed to be all right. But even as she spoke quite normally, when she worked always this pressure in her head, she said, they're in there. The priests had decided this was a rare case of atonement possession. Annalisa's voices really were devils, but devils prompted by God, wanting to make his anger heard about Vatican II and the unwanted liberalization of his church. If they could prove this, it would be a triumph for them and a serious setback for the modernizers in Rome. Eight days later, the exorcism begins. <laughs> Priests, family, friends, supporters, all focused on one sick woman. They repeat prayers and gospels again and again. Sprinkling holy water, Brandishing crucifixes, they demand that Annalisa should repeat after them, Jesus is Lord. Only then would they know the evil spirit had been driven out, back to the darkness. I think the whole um, rite of exorcism serves different social and psychological functions, depending on who we're talking about. For the exorcist and for society as a whole, it reinforces a particular religious viewpoint that there is some kind of battle between good and evil, and it sets the exorcist at the centre of that battle with a very glorious role. The exorcism is, a, is an atmosphere of hothouse conformity. People want co corroboration and confirmation that they're truly engaged with supernatural evil. They want this, and it's important to them, and they convince themselves that they're seeing things that really aren't taking place. Everything was taped. When the recorder was running, Annalisa's voice became a deep growl. 
speaking in tongues according to the priests. Outside the sessions, she still spoke normally. The tapes were sold worldwide. Annalisa's sufferings provided useful proof of the damage the Vatican reforms were doing to Germany and the church. Father Renz was in charge of the marketing. Those who appear, Lucifer, Judas, Nero, rarely, Hitler in very few cases. Does Hitler belong to the demons? He belongs to the human demons? Hitler said he could imagine himself screaming, Heil, Heil, Heil. Apart from that, he said nothing. And the other demons said about him, he might make a lot of noise, but he hasn't got anything interesting to say. In spite of her epilepsy, no doctors were allowed to attend the terrible drama being played out in the small house. Her worsening state was ignored or attributed to the stubborn demons. Everyone was playing their allotted roles, including the victim. They see that the person who is exercising them, casting out their evil spirits, is giving them so much of his dedicated time and energy, they don't want to disappoint the exorcist. They want to respond and reciprocate somehow and so they will do this by throwing themselves on the floor, trying to vomit, to regurgitate. They'll do it by ripping their clothes off, by screaming, by cursing. After six weeks of prayers and exhortations, the Michel household allowed themselves to hope the curse of the demons might have been lifted from their beloved daughter. Family friend Peter Hein was there. With each exorcism, the priest would preach, they must come out, that they must go. This was on the 31st of October, as far as I can remember. And we were all so looking forward to all of this coming to an end. Originally, we had thought that the whole thing would be over if we performed the exorcism two or three times. Es war sogar eine Zeit, und das war der 31. Oktober 1975. Das sind There was even a time. It was the 31st of October 1975, when six devils who gave themselves names came out, and this procedure for these six devils took around 40 minutes. They defended themselves and mumbled, especially when hearing. Hail Mary, full of grace, like someone who can't speak. <laughs> Hail Mary. They suffered immensely to say these words, but then the six devils left her, and for a short time she was free. We were so happy. We began to sing, praise the Lord, but with the last verse, the last word, it started. The screaming started again. When a person with epilepsy is stressed, the seizures can often get worse. And somebody put under a lot of pressure, emotional or um, physical, uh, often get worse attacks. And this is often a bit of a, a vicious circle, because the attacks in self induce more pressure, which in itself induces more seizures. The exorcists were not saving her, but making her worse. Trying to escape, Annalisa began injuring herself. The devil beat her so badly. She had lovely pearly teeth. He smashed her teeth in. The devil took her head and banged it against the wall until her entire face was swollen and bruised. Then the devil forbade her food or water. 
the Analyse, Analyse wasn't allowed to eat what she wanted anymore. When she was hungry, she wasn't permitted to eat. That's what the devil told her. She shouldn't eat. She should starve. She would get nothing. Nothing. So she collapsed from hunger and thirst. What I found so dramatic is the fact that within this family something was happening. Relatives, sisters and brothers stood there watching as this girl withered away, believing that she was possessed by the devil and not a doctor in sight who could really help her. On the 1st of July, Annalisa Michel died. Exhaustion and malnutrition had taken their dreadful toll. She was just 24. For the exorcists, it was a holy death, atonement for the mistakes of the modern church. Her soul had been saved. Scientists find that hard to accept. I think the only way that science and religion could ever meet on common ground over the issue of exorcism is if the religious believers come to accept that we don't need outmoded medieval concepts like spirit possession from the Middle Ages to explain what's going on. We can actually explain what's happening in terms of psychiatric and neurological conditions. Nor was the German law impressed. March 78, Anneliese's parents, Father Renz and Father Alt, were charged with neglect and assisted suicide. Why had they refused to let doctors see the dying girl? Karl Stenger was the family lawyer. The parents have very clearly said that the parents said it quite clearly that if a doctor were to be involved, especially a psychiatrist, then Annalisa would have been locked away in an institution and wouldn't have been able to become a teacher. This was partly the reason why medical attention was denied. All four were given six months probation, but they objected even to that, declaring their innocence and insisting the devil was to blame. Was he? I attended dozens of exorcisms of every imaginable persuasion. Did I, at any point, encounter a situation in which I myself was truly and fully convinced that here, here is a clear-cut case of demonization, a clear-cut case of diabolical possession. Did I encounter such a thing? I would say no. None of them had bad intentions, least of all the parents. They need help, not punishment. I think it's not a question of punishment, but more a question of education. It's more a question of what was going on below the surface and what was left out. There's no need to evoke a supernatural explanation for epilepsy. Um, modern science has taught us about the chemical changes which occur in seizures. We understand what these are. We understand the deaf defects which occur. We understand how the electrical disturbances synchronize. We understand the physical causes which can result in epileptic seizures. And we understand how the drugs work in epileptic seizures. For all these reasons, it's best to see this simply as a physical disease of the brain. But education and science may not be winning the battle. At a time when many churches see their members dropping, all around the world the numbers of reported exorcisms are increasing. In the US alone it's thought to be a thousand every year. The rituals vary widely, but the purpose is the same, to drive out demons. Michael Cuneo has watched its rise. The exorcism did indeed make a comeback in the United States during the 1970s and that it remains today so very much alive. Imagine this, the United States, which is arguably the most technologically advanced, the most scientifically accomplished and advanced nation in the history of the world. Imagine exorcism flourishing in the United States. It's a very curious development. People are looking for alibi stories. Everybody wants to be a victim. 
People want to escape moral responsibility. It prevents people to escape taking responsibility for their own lives and their own actions. It allows them to put blame on demons. Annalisa's fate shocked the world and her church. Two years after her death, the German bishops set up a commission of inquiry. They sent an urgent request to the Vatican that the rite should be reformed. They didn't expect it to be abolished altogether, but understood that cases like this harmed a modern church. In 1999, after 400 years, a new ritual Romanum was published. Devils and possession were to be treated in a much more modern way. Psychiatric help was to be the church's response in future. But the conservatives fought back. Don Gabriela Amort, veteran of many Vatican battles, has never changed his position on exorcism. He believes the church is now with him again. In nome di Cristo, Satan, vattene. In nome di Cristo, Satan. In the case of the two exorcisms performed by the Pope, which became very well known, I think in these cases he wanted to appoint new exorcists and have priests accept this role. Pope John Paul II is a traditionalist on many aspects of Catholic dogma and life. When he was a parish priest in Poland, he undertook two exorcisms. People like Don Amort think he understands the reality of evil and the danger of ignoring its manifestations. This sentence is not mine, but from Pope John Paul II. When I let him know that I would be meeting with so many bishops who didn't believe in the devil, he answered abruptly, he who doesn't believe in the devil doesn't believe in the gospel. Anneliese's parents built a shrine to their daughter in Klingenberg, the town where she lived her short life. Perhaps she did achieve her sacrifice for other people. Since her death, no Catholic in Germany has been subjected to the horrors inflicted on her. No bewildered victim has died in such pain. But to the end, her parents believed she really was possessed. And even on the last day, two hours before she died, she developed such strength. She performed hundreds of exercises and pulled us up and down with her. And she screamed so that people could hear her two streets away. They don't want to believe that, that the world as we see it is all there is, that reality is exhausted by the images that are flickering before us on our computer screens, that reality is exhausted by the latest development in psychopharmacology. If Michael Cuneo is right, rational answers of medicine and science are not enough. People want more, however dangerous. They want to believe that there is one last domain, one last frontier of real drama and mystery. Hence, supernatural evil and the possibility of some final conflict between the forces, ultimate forces of goodness and evil, something that we can truly be in awe of, something which is mysterious and holy and sacred and ineffable, something which leaves us trembling.